Well, thank you so much for joining us for Everything Under the Sun, the AccuWeather podcast. I'm Andy Robb. Regina Miller is still on vacation, but I am joined in the studio by executive producer uh, Ken Prell. Ken, how are you? All right, Andy. We do have a full house here today. Absolutely a full house. We should probably go around the room and let everybody introduce themselves because we're continuing on our Weather 101 uh, series that we started last week with uh, Marshall and Chrissy. That's right. How about we do youngest to oldest? (laughs) All right. (laughs) These guys will battle it out. Starting with Uh, a young guy. Uh, (laughs) This is uh, meteorologist Derek Witt. Wait, you're a meteorologist? (laughs) I can't believe they let me in. But yeah, I mean, I guess my degree says that. So it's Ohio State. It's not worth that much. Ooh. Oh. oh, and who do we have? And who do we have right next to Derek? I am meteorologist Brett Edwards <laughs> from the proud alma mater of Valparaiso University. And finally, making I, we've lost count on how many times he yeah. has been on the show. <laughs> Friend of the program, the resident old man here, <laughs> seasoned, <laughs> seasoned, seasoned veteran, yes, veteran Dave Dombeck, senior meteorologist and also the forecaster hiring coordinator here at AccuWeather. Well, welcome all of you guys to the studio today because, like Ken said, we are doing uh, another part of our Weather 101 series, and we're talking about new young meteorologists coming into AccuWeather. Last week, we talked about education, all that stuff. So um, let's start with you, Derek. Derek, um, how long have you been a meteorologist, and how long have you been here at AccuWeather? <clears throat> well, I've been at AccuWeather for a little over a year now. I started in June of 2018. I graduated from Ohio State in May of 2018. 18. Uh, so yeah, just been here a little over a year now. Uh, really liking, really liking the experience. I love being a meteorologist. This is what I was born to do, man. And now we'll move over to the the, the shy guy of the group, yeah. uh, Brett. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Chicago. Yeah. <laughs> uh, a little bit about your background, there, Brett. Ah, uh, graduated f- from Valpo in well, oh, geez, May of 2017. God, so I had, to, I had to think about it. <laughs> That's never a good sign. Dave, is that how you feel? <laughs> we won't go there. Just a few more years. <laughs> a few more decades. Uh, I was hired July of 2017, and I've been here ever since. And uh, they haven't fired me yet, so I'm clearly doing something right. Well, you got invited on the podcast, so you know you're doing something right. <laughs> there, <laughs> The ultimate honor. <laughs> and, and a little more about Brett. You were an intern. Out yes, at our I was. Office, I was right? out at the Wichita office. Yes. I was helping warn... Warn tornadoes, which a lot of people don't get the chance to do. And uh, being uh, from the plains, from the Great Lakes, tornadoes are right up my alley. I'm like, I get to warn them now. It's even better. And Dave, you know, uh, pretty much everybody knows who you are at this point. But let's let's do it. Just uh, <laughs> Not, 1980 graduate. How much you guys are? Doing, that's way way negative way. 16. That's yeah, um, negative <laughs> negative numbers. Yeah, a little before my time. Just <laughs> 19, a little. 1980 graduate of Penn State University. Uh, this is the first and only job I've had in the field. Graduated from Penn State a couple of years uh, later. So it's worked uh, out for you as well. Uh, yes, uh, thir- 39 <laughs> years plus, and I'm still here, and I don't uh, plan on retiring anytime soon. So, <laughs> yes. And we always love having you on. Now, as we're recording this, it's Labor Day. So we're right in the middle. We have Hurricane Dorian happening mm-hmm. right now. Um, <laughs> as Brad puts us I'm yeah, just yeah. cringing. Very pain look on his face right now. <laughs> it needs to go away. Oh, uh, yeah. But uh, what we wanted to do with uh, this series and uh, with this podcast is kind of do uh, kind of, uh, what, a little teaching? Well, we want to find out, you know, some different things about some meteorological terms. We also want to get your opinions, your thoughts about things, and also a little bit more about your journeys and, and also what made you most passionate about the weather. Well, like I said, you know, we got the Hurricane, hurricane Dorian happening right now, and I figure we can first start off with uh, maybe a, a question that we're seeing all over the news and all over social media right uh-huh. now today. What question would that be? Well, well, why don't we play it? They haven't come up with some kind of way to com- combat these storms yet. They keep saying, uh, you know, two days ago, three days ago, oh, it's at this, but it's going to hit all this warm weather, all this warm weather and warm water. We have a Navy. Why don't the Navy come and drop ice in the warm water so it, th- it can't get <laughs> going as fast as it's going? There's got to be ways to combat this instead of just pointing at the thing and saying, well, it's, uh, now it's getting worse. Yeah, we know it's getting worse, but you tell us, oh, it's the warm weather, oh, it's the wind. Well, we have an Air Force. All right, so the Air Force planes around to get the winds going the opposite way. But the Navy to go in circles to fight it the other way. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so I yeah. figured out, you know, since we're, uh, you know, <laughs> wait, let me, let's just start, let's just yeah, start with Brett, Brett's dying over here. I was here. gonna say, let's just start with, let's just start with the vet. Let's start with Dave Dombeck. Dave, 
What can you make of that? Well, at least he didn't uh, mention uh, nukes. <laughs> <laughs> Although at this point, I bet a few meteorologists are about ready to try it after all the work we've been going through these last few days. He didn't mention nukes. It's a step in the right direction. Yes, it was right, right. <laughs> but we're trying. We're trying to educate people here with this podcast today. So why can't we do any of this stuff? <laughs> You know, I would love to see how much ice it would truly take to bring the ocean temperatures down. I would truly be fascinated because, first off, the ocean is a large body of water, to say the least. You'd have to have one heck of an ice machine. (laughs) A bigger ice machine than we got in the break room, that's Uh, for sure. It's a little bit bigger than that. Right. (laughs) How about the idea of um, flying? Was it flying planes around in circles yes, to, to, get the, yes. to get the air yeah, going the, the, the air going the other yeah, way? Yeah, yeah. It's going to create yeah. an anti vortex. Okay, yeah. Derek, let's hear this meteorological opinion on this one. Well, you know, with a storm like Dorian, we have sustained winds of what are they? 175. Uh, it's down, down to down 155 some, now. It's still, okay. it's a monster. Regardless, it's still rocking. Th- these are winds over hundreds and hundreds, uh, thousands of square miles going in this one direction. You could probably amass every single plane on the face of the Earth, and you won't even get close to the amount of energy or <laughs> reverse flow you need to uncirculate the flow of it. It's... It reminds me of the end of Superman the movie when Superman flies around the Earth in the other way to reverse time and changes the Earth's rotation. Yeah, Science. Good, how is, Science. How, how, that's, that's a documentary to this guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Was there anything that made a semblance of sense in what he said? Anything that might have been a little credible? He uh, mentioned warm water. Right, and and the thing of it is, it's not like there is a, a, a little semblance of truth that we know, like the magic number in the ocean mm-hmm. uh, is 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Mm-hmm. Uh, you need 80 degree water or higher to, to get a storm, get a tropical storm or hurricane to develop and to maintain it. And so that there there is at least a, a little hint of truth in what they're saying about the ice and cooling things down. And that's yes. why we're doing this podcast here today, because something ridiculous like this, that which is blowing up on social media mm-hmm. right now, but, you know, to bring in the experts like you guys to be able to <laughs> kind of explain, right. you know, where we kind of need to be or where the ocean temperature needs to be. So that's great. Thank yeah. you. He's yeah, trying I mean, to think in the right direction, but his solution is just a wee lacking in logical, scientific possibility yeah. <laughs> it's second just behind the nukes yeah and actually where, where dorian is uh, the water temperatures are like what 84 85 mm-hmm. it's like yeah bath 85. water maybe 86 so it's really cooking water it's really warm water all right now do you want to move on andy to uh some actual uh real terms that we were kind of uh uh, thinking about here and, and w- want some real education on? Sure. What we were doing here, our idea is to some of the more simpler terms that, you know, everyday people may not fully understand that they hear in their local weather forecast. Mm-hmm. So what we have here in this uh, Ooh, little, oh, a little oh, box, it's a, box. Is, a, uh, is a selection of weather terms, pretty, pretty straightforward ones. So what we're going to do is we're going to go around in a circle. You get to pick one out and then we want you to tell us what these terms mean. Right. Derek, so, are you who gonna wants need to go help first? Here? Derek, Ray. are you going to need help? Derek's yeah, I'm, going I'm first. Not, I'm not good at games pick. Usually when I pick a number out of a box, I always get the worst one. You know, when you're playing like White Elephant at Christmas yeah. time, oh, yeah. I, always, I always get number one. <laughs> All right, what do we got? Ooh, we got we got heat index. Heat right, index. Right. They talk about that on the local news. We've heard it. Sometimes some people don't know what is it. Derek, what is a heat index? Okay, so the heat index, let's say the temperature is 85 degrees out. Well, when it's 85 degrees, if the humidity levels are high, the wind's not moving very much, and the sun is very strong in the sky, it will actually feel hotter on human skin than it will when the temperature actually is. So when you have humidity levels that are uh, dew points rather that are over 70 degrees, and you have a temperature of roughly 90 degrees, your heat index can be up close to 100. And what that means is that the temperature on your skin feels like 100 degrees. So if there's a thermometer, it will measure 90 degrees because that is the temperature. That is how fast the particles are moving within the air because really temperature is a speedometer for atoms and, you know, measuring how fast the molecules are moving. So on your skin, though, it will feel a little hotter than that because when your body is trying to sweat and trying to cool yourself off, your sweat cannot do that because the air is already so humid that sweat doesn't evaporate and then you feel hotter. So it feels more like 100 degrees. Yeah, and I think definitely what Derek hinted on is, you know, when the humidity is up, the, there's so much water vapor in the air. I mean, that's why when you go out on a hot, humid day, the goal of sweat is to evaporate, and that cools you down. But when it's so humid, the sweat doesn't go away. It just sticks, and that's why you go outside, and it's, oh, 
you come outside, you walk for five minutes, and you're sweating bullets, and it's because mm-hmm. it's the sweat's not evaporating. It's not cooling you down. So that's another aspect. It's your, your body's own coolant system isn't working. All right, so grade out those answers. How would you say that they did, Dave? They did very well. The one thing, the one thing I'll, I'll have, I'll have oh, a here critique. we go, here we go, here we go. Oh. I'm going to have, I'm gonna have one critique, and, and this is something when, when you know, being, uh, you know, involved in, in hiring for new forecasters and doing recruiting and talking to students and, and and so forth. One of the things I always give a challenge to students. I say, you know, you guys are bombarded for four years or four plus year, years with equations and all kind of technical terms and everything. And so when you get out of school, I mean, it's natural to just always be thinking really, you know, up in the stratosphere I mean, with all these mm-hmm. equations and tech. Mm-hmm. But the average person, the average Joe or Jane doesn't understand this stuff. And so I always give students a challenge. I say, take your, your favorite weather term, dew point, cold, for whatever it is. Now explain that to your grandmother. And so it's a lot tougher thing to do than, than you think. You guys did, did a great job, but one thing you did mention was dew point, okay? I, we all know what it is. Mm-hmm. I don't know if these guys over Actually, here do. Yeah. Let's throw another one in, into the mix right now, dew point. So, so Derek did a good job, but he mentioned dew point. That might be a little bit above most of the public's perception. They're hearing that more, but they really don't know what dew point is. Okay, well, what is it? Well, dew point temperature is uh, the temperature that if you cooled the air parcel in which that air is in, that water would, the the humidity level would reach 100% and that water would begin to condense. So when the air temperature is not much above the dew point and the dew point is closer to that air temperature level, it feels more humid because there is more water vapor present in the air. Let's say it's a cool day, you know, 60 degrees. You walk outside, you're like, man, it's humid out. Odds are the dew point is upper 50s or near 60. I always say if it's a really humid day, your dew point and temperature, they're going to be very close to each other. When you've got a big spread in temperature and dew point, that's a dry day. My mom always said, you know, she looked at relative humidity. It's like, it means nothing. means nothing. Mm-hmm. means yeah. nothing. Yeah. You look at dew point, it, 50, 50s for dew point, that's a good day. 60s, getting a little humid, 70 there may as well be three feet of snow on the ground. She's not going outside. On, on a hot, humid day, three in the afternoon, temperature 90, dew point 70. It's miserable. Oh, it's you know, awful. The, the relative humidity at that time, 50%. doesn't tell you anything. Yeah, it tells yeah. you nothing. Years ago, in my early years as a, as a forecaster here, I was on a mission to totally eliminate the relative humidity and just get rid of it. <laughs> I was on a mission. Never quite got there. How'd that but, go? How'd, uh, how'd that go? <laughs> we'll talk about that later. <laughs> All right, I'll carry well, the mission forward. Well, yeah. let's move on to our next phrase. We'll go from heat index, and we'll put Brett... On the hot seat. Uh, How about that segue there? That was pretty good, wasn't it? All right, what do you got yeah, there, Brett? Right. <laughs> oh, okay. We get this a lot here at work. The difference between partly cloudy and partly sunny. Ooh. Yeah, this is one I wanted to know about. <laughs> now this, I always, uh, I tend to think partly cloudy. Uh, you've got some clouds, I would generally say under 50%. When I look at partly, I think less than 50%. So if I see partly sunny... I'd say there's definitely more clouds than sun, probably in the 60 to 70% coverage of the total sky that you can see. We're partly cloudy. Uh, I tend to think that you're looking at probably that 30% coverage of clouds, more sun than clouds. And this could change throughout the times of the year, right, Dave? This is what we were talking about the other day. That's right. Uh, Whether it's partly sunny, partly or mostly sunny, we were giving an example, um, and it depends on the time of the day uh, with the sun angle, but even more importantly, the time of the year. So let's say you look up at the sky, and it's the middle of the day. It's high noon, okay? Um, And it's a June day, right around the solstice, right around the first day of summer. Uh, Maybe, you know, percentage-wise, there's four-tenths of the sky is being covered by puffy cumulus clouds, little cotton ball clouds, and and, deep blue skies. So, So we have more than... You know, more than 50% uh, of the sky is, is sunshine, but we do have about 40% is cloud. On that June day with a high sun angle in the middle of the day, that's going to look mostly sunny. On that same day, say, just take a snapshot, take a screenshot of that, <laughs> of that sky. Now it's, now it's uh, December, 410 sky cover, puffy clouds, high noon. You know where the sun is high noon on a, on a December day? It's way down on the horizon. The, the angle is way lower. And so that could almost look mostly cloudy because of the way the sun is coming through those clouds. 
it at best it looks like it's a mix of clouds and sun and it could almost look mostly cloudy just because of the time of the year so that's you know again that's at the time of the year time of the day one of those terms partly sunny partly su- cloudy one of them could only be used at night unless you're like up in barrel <laughs> yeah. alaska one of them can only be used at nighttime. Excellent point. <laughs> and that is why he has the word expert in front of his title. <laughs> you, you got that. <laughs> Just keep hanging around this guy. You'll eventually get there. <laughs> Someday. <laughs> now we have a decision to make because I know that Dave will knock these out of the park. Should we just keep it? Should we just yeah, keep let's, testing let's these keep guys? It. Oh, keep testing these right. guys. I was All testing right, Derek, it up in you, school. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going to turn away. Oh, <laughs> yeah, Very I'm official. Random. Very official. <laughs> All right. What do we got this time? All right, so we have wind shear. That's a very appropriate one. Given That's the one that we're hearing yes. right now. Oh, yes. A lot of people are hearing the word, uh, the phrase wind shear right now. So um, Remember, Derek, you're talking to the average Joe yes. and Jane. <laughs> hey, Grandma, if you're listening. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> okay, so wind shear, this is a very important term to understanding hurricanes and how they work. Okay. Wind shear is, is strong winds uh, in higher levels of the atmosphere. And to get a hurricane to develop and to allow it to strengthen, you need less wind shear. So when you have not very strong winds up in higher levels of the atmosphere, that that hurricane can continue to grow and become more powerful. But when you have stronger shear, that those higher wind speeds, when you get up into the atmosphere, that tends to cut off these the convection that forms the the, the warm air rising that forms these hurricanes. And so when you have higher wind shear, hurricanes struggle to form. But when you have lower wind shear, those are more conducive conditions to allowing hurricanes to develop. I'd say good explanation, was, but we still mm. don't know what wind shear is. Yeah, <laughs> I think. And I All think right, he here. missed good, one. Good attempt, Derek. Let the, let the Valpo grad step in. Uh-oh. The disrespect. <laughs> okay, Brett. The one thing he did mention there is correct. Wind speed. But there are two. Wind shear is the difference in speed and direction of the wind at the surface and aloft. He mentioned speed, and that's that's true. That's a part of it. Mm-hmm. If you've got winds out of the west at 50 miles per hour, about 1,000 feet above your head, and you've got winds out of the west at 20 miles per hour down at the surface, that's, mm-hmm. that's wind shear. But there's more to it. If you have winds out of the northwest, about 1,000 feet above your head, mm-hmm. and the winds out of the west at the surface, that can be the same speed, 1,000 feet above your head, and at the surface, but if that direction is different, that's wind shear. And you need unidirectional winds aloft and at the surface, and the speeds need to be the same. That is low wind shear, when the speed and the direction is the same. And that's what is very conducive for hurricanes, that, that unidirectional flow, not just at the surface, but aloft as well. In a real simple sense, wind shear is the change in wind speed or wind direction either in the vertical or in the horizontal. That's You boil it down, that's what it is. Now, one of the things that I was thinking when you think of that term, you think of you know the word shear, like scissors. So does that have to do with a kind of cutting, almost, to live up to its name? Maybe perhaps its impact on the yeah. development of, of weather, like hurricanes. Uh, it shears the hurricane. If you have high wind shear, it shears that hurricane. It, it cuts it off it's that that's a that's an interesting you know we're not wordsmiths here but that that is a very good question andy i i gotta know we both answered it ohio state or valpo who answered it more correctly (laughs) i I think i think i have to go toward valpo on this and valpo reigns supreme (laughs) (laughs) all right well our one loss for the season we'll get we'll get back to it (laughs) (laughs) well before we uh wrap up the show when we do uh one more one more. One All more. Right. One more. more. I'll tell you what. Uh, why don't we have Dave pick this one, and then he can read the term, and then both you guys can Ooh. give it your shot. Go ahead, Sounds Dave. Like You're plan. on the All clock, right, here buddy. Here we go. All right. High and low pressure. High and low pressure, guys. Um, to boil down pressure in a, trying to make it in a more of a basic sense, it's basically the amount of stuff above your head. And what I mean by stuff is air molecules. Uh, atmosphere is made up of hydrogen, not nitrogen, oxygen, all those air molecules. It's how much of that is above you. And we measure that in hectopascals, which is a fancy unit for air pressure. I'm not going to try and go into that too much. I don't even think I could spell that. Oh, trust me. I couldn't either. <laughs> I know you can't spell So you went to Valpo. <laughs> wow. Oh, man. Oh. <laughs> I had to get my clap back in when Woo-hoo. I could. Respect. You know, we have a new podcast called Field Conditions yeah. about fantasy football. That's where I was expecting all the trash talk to take place. 
place. Here. Now it's happening here on everything under the sun. Here it's comes amazing. some of that cutting shear there. Right? Oh, there it is. <laughs> the best way I can describe high and low is virtually more stuff or less stuff, air molecules above you. And I, the best way I try to explain this to people is the difference between high and low. When you were a kid, you were taking a bath. Did you try and push all the water to one end of the tub? If you were able to successfully do that, the area that has more water, that's high pressure. And the, and the half of the tub that's got less water, that's the low pressure. It's less stuff, essentially. Derek? Well, uh, high pressure and low pressure, he summed up pretty well what the effect of it is with the air being above you. And I think what you observe in terms of weather conditions with the high and low pressure, high pressure, generally speaking, means good weather because when you have more air molecules above you, it brings a bring, it, there's more weight, there's more atmosphere above mm -hmm. you. So it's pushing down on the Earth's surface. And that does not allow warm air to rise, which forms thunderstorms, rain, snow, etc. But when you have low pressure, there's less atmosphere above you and air can rise. That's when you get your thunderstorms, snowstorms, etc. Dave, what do you think? Close to a tie. Oh, Ooh, close to a tie. And, right. and Derek, Derek had the main word that I was thinking. It's the weight. And you were saying stuff. Okay. Stuff. <laughs> Very but, technical term. But Derek, Derek had the key word. It's the weight. It's the weight of the weight of the air on top of you. And and like you were saying about good, you know, high and low and, you know, nice weather versus stormy weather. And as far as like the way the air blows around high pressure systems and low pressure systems in the northern hemisphere where we live, uh, it, they blow clockwise around high pressure systems and the air is going away from it's spreading out and it's and it's going away from the high and so that uh, leads to sinking air and sinking air leads to drying and nice weather most of the time uh, the opposite is the case with low pressure systems it blows counterclockwise and it spins the air spins in toward the storm like we have in a hurricane uh, to, to the extreme example and so as the air comes in and, and it converges and it comes together, these wind streams coming together, well, air is a, is a substance. It's a, you know, we can't, where does it go? You got two air streams coming together. Where does that air go? It can't go down into the ground. Where does it have to go if they crash together? It has to go up. As the air goes up, it rises, it cools, can't hold as much water, and there goes your clouds and precipitation. So that's why low-pressure systems are are usually associated with nasty weather and precipitation. So that's kind of taking it one step further, guys. But mm -hmm. I would I would rate this as a tie. Excellent. Yes. There right, we go. All right. <laughs> yes. Well, now we have, we're coming off a tie. I know I said one more, but I lied because I, I looked through the uh, the little basket here. Yeah. Ooh, and I pulled you out cheated. One. I did. I you cheated. cheated. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I got one here. Penn State uh, for you guys, and it's one that we've heard, of course, with uh, Dorian going on in the hurricanes. Storm surge. Ooh. Okay, that's a very appropriate one. And actually, this is, uh, with storm surge, you can actually sort of bounce that off our discussion we were just having about, <clears throat> excuse me, high pressure and low pressure. Uh, hurricanes, at the very center of them, it's very low pressure. That's why, that's how they become these strong, high, powerful systems. And with low pressure, with that rising air, you it actually has the effect of it slightly will li allow the ocean level to come up a little bit, but the stronger effect of storm surge is the winds that are around the hurricane. Now, this is especially prevalent on the northern and on the eastern sides of hurricanes. The winds that are spinning around the center of the hurricane will push the water with it. They'll, they'll kind of like almost in effect circulate and move the water around the storm. So if a hurricane is coming ashore, if you are on, if, if it's going to make, if the center is going to make landfall south or to the west of where you are, the winds coming around the east side of the storm will push water inland on that side of the storm. And the stronger the winds, the stronger the storm, the higher the storm surge can be. And the storm surge can reach as, reach over 20 feet in some of the strongest storms. I think that's what wow. some of the, what we were seeing in the Bahamas there. So the high winds is pushing the water ashore. So it's almost like it wouldn't appear like a tsunami or a, or, you know, a large, like uh, geologically developed wave coming ashore. It would just be a slow rise in water that slowly pushes inland. And yeah. that's the most destructive part of the hurricanes. I mean, we mm -hmm. think of wind, certainly that, you know, in a category four or five, you got tremendous amount of wind, right. but the most destructive by far is the water, and a lot of that is by way of the storm surge. That big, basically, you look at it, and, and Derek is right. You have very, very extremely low pressures right in the middle of that hurricane, mm -hmm. and so if you have less weight pushing down on the water, much less weight pushing down, 
what's going to happen, you're literally going to have like almost like a bubble of higher than normal water okay. that's going to be associated with that hurricane. And as it comes inland, that big bubble of, you know, three feet, 10 feet, you know, 15 feet, whatever this that uh, above what it should be, that level of the of the Gulf or the of the ocean or whatever coming inland. And it's just that bubble of, of, of much higher than normal water that comes inland and floods all the areas that are low lying yep. as it comes inland. And I also think uh, one important thing to note here is it can have the opposite effect as well. Uh, for some people who may not know, Hurricane Irma came ashore yes. in southwest Florida, right around Naples, I believe. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And down in Tampa Bay, they saw the bay water drop about 20 feet. Because, as you said, the water's swinging counterclockwise. That wind is coming out of the northeast at an incredible rate. It's pushing the water out oh, of the bay. Right. Okay. Offshore flow, right. Offshore and, flow. And right. they oh. they made, like, I can't remember. I think it was, uh, like, an old ship or something. They discovered something in the bay that yeah. they hadn't seen before because Ooh. it's bare. People are walking where there's normally 30 feet of water. Right. The anti The anti The, yeah. the anti storm surge. surge. Reverse storm yeah. surge. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, really, yeah. storm surge is really one of the most, you know, critical and, and borderline dangerous things. Oh, absolutely. Right. Absolutely, absolutely. one hundred percent. No doubt, no doubt. So we're all in agreement here. This yes. was fun. Did you guys have a good time? Oh, I had a great yeah. time. I had a great time. Yeah. Oh, Installment number fun. one, right, Andy? That's right. <laughs> so, Dave, um, Dave, before we wrap things up, because you know you you were kind enough to bring you know these two fellows in to talk with us today. Uh, real quick, tell us a little bit about your experience when it comes to training new forecasters and and bringing people into the world of meteorology. Well, really, I mean, it starts with the passion. It starts with that love of the weather, which I. I think we all, as meteorologists, I think we we joke about it, but you know, you start, you talk to your, you, you know, your your family, your friends, and it's like they look at you like you have a third eye or something, you know. And I always say it's like either a missing gene or maybe it's probably like an extra gene, being a weather weenie, you know, being a <laughs> weather weenie, a weather, yep. oh yeah, a weather nut, you know. And yeah. and so that's where it starts. And you know, when I'm when I'm interviewing uh, uh, potential new forecasters, the very first question I ask is, you know, when did you first get interested in the weather and meteorology? Now. I remember you that, asking me that, Dave. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, I remember that too. Yeah, and, and and it's now not to say that you know if I I if I get somebody a candidate that oh I, I got interested in high school junior you know and that's that's all well and good but most the vast majority of our forecasters here they got that passion you know when they were probably still in diapers or 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 at least you know in kindergarten first second grade mm-hmm. or whatever. It's just, that's part of our life. You know, we just love the weather. We get excited about things that, you know, that most people couldn't care less about. They just want to know, you know, is it going to rain on my picnic tomorrow, my baseball game? That's all they care about. But we want to know why. I was always the, you know, the curious George when I was a kid. You know, why? Yeah. You know, the why, why, why part of it. And as you said, I mean, they look at us like we have a third eye. I, you know, summer's in between college. I'd go home for a few, I'd go home for the summer and, I'd be, hey, mom, I'm going to be gone for the day. I'm going with a few friends. Oh, where are you going? I'm going to go chase tornadoes in northwest Illinois. <laughs> and she looks at me like, what are you Wait. thinking? <laughs> and I I can guarantee you, my mom always tried to talk me out of it. I'm like, no, I, I want to go see the weather. I, I want I want to go see a supercell. Thank you very much. Yep. And I was always that crazy person in the winter. Uh, you know, there's a snowstorm coming. Everybody's going, oh, please miss us. They're all only an inch. I only want to shovel an inch. And I'm like, come on, let's see a foot. Let's yeah. see two feet. I was cheering on the the big snow. Wait, what yeah. kid in school cheers for one inch? We want the snow day. <laughs> <laughs> That's very true. So, um, Dave, real quick, if, if there's somebody listening to this podcast right now and is studying meteorology and might be interested in, in joining up with, with your team, uh, where could they go? Who could they contact? Well, I mean, certainly they could reach out, and, and if they are a meteorology major and you know they're looking for a job, either an internship, uh, always go to our website, and we have the careers link there, and just follow the, uh, the links there. Uh, we will be posting in early January uh, the internships for next year. Currently, we're looking for a couple of uh, more forecasters to, to bring on board this fall. Uh, we're kind of getting later into the process now. Uh, but uh, yeah, just check with us and always reach out to us. And, and we'd be happy to, uh, if you're traveling, let's say you're just a weather weenie and you're traveling through Pennsylvania, you know, reach out to us and maybe we could arrange a, a tour and sh- show you the, the facilities here mm-hmm. in State College. You know, that's what uh, Chrissy Pitanowski was actually saying last week with her advice, you know, meet the hiring managers, get mm-hmm. yourself out there and meet those people. Yeah, connections are, are really yeah. important, those connections. And, and I always say, because... Um, as you said, I interned at the Wichita office, and uh, for all you 
meteorology majors out there, if you haven't, go to the AMS annual meeting every every January because mm-hmm. I met the hiring manager at Wichita, and he said, we have an internship. I applied. I got the internship. Towards the end, me and the other interns, well, you know, why, why, why us? Why'd you pick us? A handful of reasons came out, but he said, you know, at the end of the day, you're the people I met at AMS. Networking, networking, networking. Fantastic. That is how you get internships. Fantastic that is how you advice. get jobs. That is what springboards your career. And it's absolutely about who you know helping you get your foot into the field because as I'm sure uh, anybody in the field knows and as you're getting further into your major, you'll realize it's a very competitive field, meteorology. Mm-hmm. There's, there tends to be more graduates than there are jobs opening when people get out of college. And uh, and the, uh, the but the but if you get the chance to get an internship here at AccuWeather, we do hire in some interns uh, after they finish college, mm-hmm. and it sort of gets you exposure. So a- any internship that will get you exposure to companies or uh, news stations or anybody who might be interested in hiring, they see what your potential is, and they say, hey, this person could be a great fit to work with us after they graduate. So internships are critical uh, to your success, and also use social media to your advantage. Like use mm-hmm. Twitter, use Facebook, uh, follow. Uh, uh, follow other meteorologists, professional meteorologists. Feel free to interact with them, ask them questions, and and maybe even send them a direct message if you're interested mm-hmm. in an internship. Uh, you, use that modern technology to your advantage. Absolutely, yeah. and it's not just it's not just know the people in the company. It's meteorology is a very intertwined community. Yes, the hiring manager here or at another company mm-hmm. probably knows the other hiring manager yes. at a handful of others. Yeah, so even just if they know you, let's say you know you want to stay closer to home or you want to go west coast. Hiring managers out here can put in that word for you. They can help you. So it's, again, it's a very intertwined community. Just get out and get to know people. Yeah, we're, we're a relatively small field when you compare us to, you know, whether, uh, you know, accountants. Engineers. Engineers, right? There are millions of them. It's a pretty small community. And even if you don't know somebody, you know somebody who knows somebody. You know, there's, there's those connections there. All right. Well, this is, like Andy said, this has been great. And uh, Dave, I can't wait to do another one of these with you uh, for our Weather 101 series. Uh, so that's going to wrap it up for this week on uh, Everything Under the Sun. Uh, for meteorologist Derek Witt, Brett Edwards, and expert meteorologist <laughs> Dave <Expert>. Dombeck. <laughs> He's earned the title. <laughs> He's Andy Robham, Ken Prell. Thanks so much for listening to Everything Under the Sun. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. Be sure to subscribe to AccuWeather's Everything Under the Sun, giving you the stories behind the weather and so much more. New episodes every Thursday. Just search for AccuWeather on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, or visit accuweather.com slash podcast.